Consider for a moment this question. Have you ever wondered what it would be like when that last person is preached the final message of the gospel? A time will arrive when someone shares the final gospel spoken into the final ear or heart of all humanity and those beloved words detailing the death, burial, resurrection, and subsequent redemption of sins through our Messiah, the single greatest message ever given. And at that very moment, after every believer had been but a living testimony to the glory and sacrifice of the Lord, will now stand not only as testimony, but instead we stand bearing the witness to the coming of our Lord Yeshua in the clouds and the light of a candle shall shine no more in the world and the most precious message ever told will be told in this world no more for it is written as I live saith the Lord every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God Romans 14:11. My name is Lee, and I gave up my love of bikes for my love of the Lord, and it's been a rough ride getting there. Over 15 years ago, I almost lost everything. My house, my family, and without the grace of God, I might have lost my life. And I'm not saying that bikes are bad, but if you hold up anything in this world higher than God, then you're likely embracing an idol. And I can show you how anything in this world is either bringing you closer or further away from our Heavenly Father. And for years before I submitted to God in Jesus' name, I held my love of bikes above almost everything. But God can take anything in our life and make it work to His good. Evenu Shalom Alehem. I bring peace unto you. In the native Hebrew language of my Lord and Savior Yahshua HaMashiach, the one called Jesus Christ. Barah Hashem. Blessed be the name. Todo Rabbah Yahweh. I thank God so much. You are now watching the conservative racer. Remember, the race is not over until Christ returns. I confess, I often have to learn things the hard way. Our Heavenly Father would prefer if we just did things His way to start. Like even now, for example, this was not originally the topic that I had in mind for today's video. 
but fortunately I stopped and prayed first. But I don't always seek my Heavenly Father like we should, but in His grace, I can still feel His influence through the Holy Spirit. Even when I do something without discussing it with Him first, He's still there guiding me. God can take anything in our life and make it work to His good. And it's so amazing how I can see Him directing my steps for as much as I will submit to Him. Sometimes we're a hard-headed people and we have to learn things the hard way. I'll give you an example. When I was living cycle dreams, making DVDs, doing shows, writing magazines, I was following my heart's desires, but my father would have been better served by me submitting to his will. I always say, there's someone out there waiting for you to be what God has called you to be so that you can be a blessing in their life. You see, God has a plan for everybody and your experiences can help prepare you for that plan. But it's up to you how much suffering you need to go through before you submit yourself to God's will. I've learned the hard way. I've said it many times, I've almost lost everything in my life that I cared for. But in His grace, He still taught me many lessons and skills while I was living in the world. Skills like networking, writing, production. Praise God. Friends, what you have just heard is a short testimony to the glory of God in my life. But there's more to that word testimony, and I hope to share and discuss it with you today. I know I always say this, but today's lesson will be short, and I'm excited today that we define what the goal is for my ongoing video series. And when I say we, I'm talking about my Heavenly Father, because whatever we do in life, if we don't include him, then there's no telling what the outcome may be. So my goals for this Bible study are to reach unbelievers and new believers who need a little help with some common topics of biblical concern. But also for my brothers and sisters that are well studied in the Bible, I want to provide some perspective on each topic that may not be so obvious to us at first. So that being said, let's talk about testimony. In Luke 8.39, it reads, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. When I think about testimony, I not only think about professing the glory of God in our life, but I also think about hardship, trials, and the way God can turn tragedy into victory while growing you through the experience that can now be used to lift up someone having the same problem. The basic idea of testimony as commonly observed by believers in church, we find members offer examples of their experiences in life and they explain how God made a difference for them and their family. Let's call this a testimony to God's glory. And let's take a look at how the word is defined and see if we can find an even deeper explanation of the idea of testimony. Webster's defines the word testimony as a declaration made orally, first-hand authentication of a fact, a divine decree attested to in scriptures. In the Strong's we find it says, witness, evidence, testimony, reputation. Let's take that word witness in the Strong's and transition over to that for a moment while I share a quick story. In the last few days, I noticed a lot of people I've spent sometimes years preaching to and they're no closer to knowing Christ than when I started. I realize the point comes when we have to just give them a testimony to the truth of Christ and give it up to God from there. What I mean is we can't continue to entertain endless debate that goes around in circles. We need to just tell it point blank and keep it moving. When I'm preaching, I normally try to teach and hopefully convince someone of God's word. But when I'm, as I say, telling it, I'm not trying to convince anyone anymore. I'm just making a blunt declaration of the truth of Christ and God's word. 
This type of testimony might also be explained as being a witness. Let's look at the definition. Webster's defines witness as attesting to the fact or event, being able to testify to something having taken place, personal knowledge of something, affirmation by word usually religious faith. Strong's Concordance says, an eye or ear witness, as in the first-hand account of an event or thing. In Matthew 18, 16, it reads, But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. People today believe every nonsense they read written by so-called scholars, often on their opinions. But the word of God is not only inspired, but has a solid criteria of verifiable witnesses to back up what was to be handed down. Similar to going to court, where witnesses would attest to their first-hand observation of said events. We too will be called on to be such witnesses in end times. God's word is already established in heaven, but here on earth, we will be called on to bear witness to it. A brother in Christ named Dale spoke to me on the topic of witness the other day, and I didn't make the connection between testimony and witness until now. As my brother Dale would explain, we're in a dress rehearsal right now. We're giving a testimony to our Heavenly Father and how He moves in our lives. But at some point, testimony will have to become simply being a witness to the truth. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. And what I'm going to say to end this video off may sound extreme, so I'll start off with a verse to validate my statement. In Revelation 18.23, it reads, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. This verse is explaining an end to the light that believers give unto this world. And the word we share in Christ Jesus will no longer be given. One day prior to me understanding what this verse meant, I was driving home and the most horrific thought came to my mind for me that I began to weep. What I believe God showed me was a small, very tiny example of what it would be like if we were separated from our Heavenly Father's presence. I confess I've lived a dangerous and reckless life. I can't imagine how many times God's grace was on me. For me to even still be alive now, I can't thank Him enough. And the only thing that compared to what I experienced that day was years ago in a dream when I had what seemed to be a glimpse of what seemed like hell to me. Believe me, you do not want to be apart from the creator of all things. This verse is a literal warning of the possibility of that happening. So as we read the verse, we find our father basically saying your time is up. He's referring to Babylon, or in other words, the world. Two times God said, no more. Think about it. No more light, no more voice, and it sounds like no more chances. Imagine if the Spirit of God was no longer among men, which would seem to indicate a completion of when Jesus said in John 14, 26, that he would send us the Comforter or the Holy Spirit. I don't believe we think about this much, but imagine when the gospel has been preached to all the world, that stage is done now. A time will come when it's no longer about preaching anymore. It will only be about being a witness to the truth as we ready ourselves to receive the King, Christ Jesus, the Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach. And I can't speak on how God will see your heart and judge you after death, 
But from these verses, it seems evident that here on earth, there will be an end to your window of opportunity. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's time to get familiar while you still can. And for those who are familiar, it's time to grow even closer still. God bless you.